Good morning, everybody, to the BioXL webinar number 66. Today, we have Oli Judge and Arno Prum speaking about efficient Scroman CP2K computer source usage for QMMM simulation of biomolecular system. Oli and Arno come from APCC from the University of Edinburgh. I host this webinar. I'm Alessandra Villa from the Royal Institute of Technology. So the presenter of today, uh, or the participating today, Oli is an application consultant, has a background in computational chemistry and physics research. She is currently focused on exploring the performance of high performance computing application use in scientific research. In particular, she's focused on QMMM calculation using CP2K. And she's looking how to improve the performance of such a calculation. She's a member of BioXL, and she's also part of the CSS team for the UK National Computer Service, Archer 2. Arno is a research software engineer. His background is in computational statistical physics, and actually currently is working on a number of projects improve, improving parallel performance of, of uh, scientific software in a way that such a software can take advantage of modern computer architecture. He's also involved in training and a lot of uh, European projects and not in supporting research using HPC facility. He's also part of the UK National Computer Center. Please. Now I give them the word. OK. Welcome, everybody. Um, so thank you for coming. Uh, so uh, yes, I'm Arno. And here today with me is Holly. Uh, and we're going to be telling you about uh, how to use uh, CPUs and GPUs that are commonly found in HPC systems uh, to do efficient biomolecular QM simulation with Chromax and using CP2K. Before I proceed, I just want to make clear that uh, although I'll be presenting the main part of the presentation, a lot of the work actually done has been done by Holly, a lot of the technical work. So um, if you can correct me on anything that I get wrong, anything I miss out, and uh, if you have any questions at the end, I will try my best to answer them, but probably Holly will jump in with, with the real answer. So we'll, we'll see how we go. Now, the reason why we put together this webinar is because, as some of you may already know, um, BioXL has been producing uh, an interface in Gromax, integrated with Gromax, that allows usage of CP2K to do QMM simulation. Uh, so my colleague, our colleague Dmitry Morozov at the University of Uvascula in Finland has developed this collaboration with the Gromax development team at KTH uh, Stockholm. And we have seen people starting to use this. Now, as people are starting to use this, they're, starting to, they're asking questions like, um, not only how do I technically use this, how do I get all the right settings and parameters right, um, but also, you know, people use GPUs all the time to run Gromax, uh, and Gromax runs great on GPUs, especially improvements made in the last couple of years. So people say, okay, well, can I use G my GPUs that I run Gromax on to use C to run CPUK? Should, should I do that? Um, how many how many cores should I use? Um, you know. CP2K has lots of different QM treatments. Uh, which one should I choose? And we have already organized in BioXL uh, a workshop on the really on the, the software agnostic QM MM modeling aspects. So kind of the underpinning choices about modeling, um, which addresses what, for example, what functional you might like to choose. But what we're trying to address with this webinar here today is really a lot of the concrete questions that we've seen people have that will hopefully make it easier to start using uh, HPC machines to do research with Chrome and CP2K. Um, and it should also hopefully serve as a, as a reference guide for when you're applying for compute time on, for example, whether it's your local machine at a university or a research institute, or some of these uh, national level HPC machines, up, up right up until the largest supercomputers run uh, in the EU by Prace and Euro HPC. So what we're going to try and cover today is um, briefly say something about Chrome X and CP2K parallel execution, just enough to point out why we're taking the approach uh, in telling you about the parallel performance of CP2K that we will take. 
then I'll introduce the BioXL QMM benchmark suite, which Holly and I have developed. Um, then we'll look at a little bit of detail at uh, the actual parallel performance of CP2K with these biomolecular QMM benchmarks that form the benchmark suite, both on CPUs and GPUs. And we'll try to gather some lessons learned about how to make efficient use of HPC resources. So as Alessandro already said, please feel free at any point to ask any questions that pop up. Uh, you don't need to wait until the end. You can ask them and we'll, we'll address them at the end. Um, but you know, as they come up, just, just feel free to answer them. So as I said, this webinar is, is very concrete. Um, so it, it's meant to be very practical. Uh, so we, want, we do want to say something at quite a high level about the way that Chromex and CP2K work together when you run QMM simulations using the new interface that Dimitri has developed. Why are we telling you this? Because it will justify why we're going to focus on CP2K parallel performance and we're actually going to forget about Gromax for the rest of the webinar after I've said this. Why is that? Well, because the way that the interface works is uh, during the uh, standard MD loop uh, that Gromax does, uh, the calculation of the energies and forces on the uh, QM atoms and on the MM atoms due to the coupling between the QM and the MM atoms, that is computed not by Gromax because it doesn't know how to do quantum chemistry, but that is computed by CP2K. So Gromax is launched in parallel like you would normally launch Gromax in parallel on a number of ranks, number of MPI ranks, using a number of cores, using a number of GPUs, whatever you, you might usually do. Um, then the Gromax, when it comes to calculating these QM and QMMM interactions, passes the information about the atomic uh, electronic structure to CP2K, which then computes the QM uh, and QMM coupling and forces and energies. It does that in parallel using the same cores uh, that Gromax has been running on, passes back the forces and energies to Gromax to then proceed with time integration. Now, why did I say we can forget about Gromax uh, for now? Because actually, it maybe comes as no surprise that these QM and QMM coupling calculations are far more computationally costly than calculating the classical forces and energies and performing the time integration. So what that means is that the parallel performance of doing QM simulation with Gromax and CP2K is pretty much entirely dependent on the parallel performance of CP2K running whatever it is given by Gromax when Gromax calls its functionality. So in other words, to understand how to efficiently use Chromax with CPGK to do QMM simulation, we basically need to understand, or we can, it's enough, for now anyway, to understand how CP2K efficiently uses CPU cores and GPU cores to, um, to, do, these, to do these calculations that Chromax is asking it to do. So now to introduce the BioXL uh, QMMM benchmark suite. So as part of our work in the project, uh, Holly and I have been looking at uh, whether we can, so we have two goals with BioXL in this work. Uh, we're trying to make it easier for people to use CP2K for QMM simulation of biomolecular systems. And the interface is, is, is you know, a way to facilitate that as well. And we're also trying to see if we can uh, see whether you know, there are places where CP2K could be maybe better for this particular kind of simulation because uh, CP2K is, is traditionally computational chemistry code that's been used for material science and all kinds of all kinds of problems, not necessarily as much for biomolecular systems and also not necessarily as much uh, its QMMM functionality, which has been around for, for a while now, since about 2004 or so, I think. So as part of this effort to understand, analyze, uh, CP2K's performance and how we could improve it, and to address improving usability of uh, CP2K in combination with Chromax for biomolecular simulation, we have gathered a number of benchmarks together. Now, some of these have been adapted um, courtesy of our, our colleague Emiliano Ippoliti at Forschungszentrum Mulich, who published together with our collaborators a paper on another interface that lived, lives still on in Chromax as well for using not CP2K but CPMD. Uh, to also do QM, QMM simulation. So we've adapted some of those um, benchmarks to work with CP2K. Now we have adopted quite a strategic approach because and a systematic approach because we know already in advance that um, there are a number of key aspects about the QM treatment 
of our QM region in the biomolecule and the QMM coupling that um, affect the, the, the performance and essentially uh, influence not only the computational cost of what we're asking CP2K to do, but also, um, for example, what code path, what part of CP2K is being exercised when we run these benchmarks. So the approach we've taken is to take what are essentially three different biomolecular systems, MQAE, CBD5, and CLC19. I should say the CBD5 is also being provided by uh, colleague Faris Dimitri Modosov. So what these are is MQAE is an acetoethyl esterine solution. So it's a solute solvent system. Uh, CBD5 is uh, a phytochrome. It's biliverdin chromophore bound to a dimer. CLC is a large membrane, membrane protein system. Uh, it's a chloride ion channel embedded in a lipid bilayer. So, um, and as well as representing a variety of different biomolecular systems, we've chosen these, these benchmarks specifically because they have certain features that span a range um, of, 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 of uh, ways that they exercise CP2K, which you want to investigate um, and share with people as well. Namely, um, the number of QM atoms, number of atoms that we designated to be treat treated using QM within these systems goes from very small, 19, growing through 34, 68, medium to a little bit larger, 253. Now, though that is actually fairly small compared to the, 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 some of the calculations that CPTUK can do, uh, scaling to thousands, of, tens of thousands of, of, of uh, atoms. Um, but uh, this is what, is what is the way that we want to use uh, QM for a system of interest, for a region of interest uh, in our biomolecule, whether it's calculating spectral properties or whether it's calculating bond formation or breaking or, or proton transfer, things like that. Um, so another key aspect about the QM treatment, it, well, as well as the QM atoms, we should consider what kind of total system these form a part of. So all the other atoms that are not QM atoms are treated, treated classically. And so you can imagine that if the balance between the, the, the number of atoms in the system that is QM and the number of atoms that is classical is, is very different, that could also give rise to different uh, 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 usage of the code path of CP2K. That's why we have one system, the MQOE, which is a rather small, uh, fairly small number of total atoms, uh, 16,000 in total, and the other two, CBD5 and CLC, are much larger. Now, a key aspect of the QM treatment for the QM region is to choose the density functional approximation uh, within CP2K. So here, uh, we have incorporated uh, some common, two common uh, generalized gradient approximations, BLIP and PPE and also two common uh, hybrid functionals that incorporate some heart rate fork exchange, namely B3LIP and PPE0. Uh, because as we see, as we shall see, these exercise the code in, in quite different ways. Then to isolate the effect, so we are trying to choose, choose our benchmarks so that we can, by comparing any two benchmarks, we can see the effect, we can isolate the effect of, for example, changing the number of Q atoms, but keep it, keeping everything else the same. Or for example, changing the functional that's used, but keeping every, everything else the same. Or for example, changing the QM cell size uh, that defines the, the spatial QM region and keeping everything else the same. And then seeing what the effect of that is. Now by teasing apart the effect on CP2K performance in that way systematically, that has helped us in identifying, not only profiling and identifying you know, how CP2K um, um, performs uh, uh, as these vary, but also hopefully this will allow uh, you who are here today and anybody who watches this recording later on to understand how their usage of compute resources uh, change of CP2K uh, and the usage of compute resources changes as a result of a decision to, for example, you know, include more QM atoms uh, or for example, to expand the QM cell size. Um, we have used, for most of these results, we've used uh, one, the same base set, which is a uh, base set that is quite suitable for um, molecular systems, uh, as the name suggests, MOLOPT, optimized for molecular systems. Um, and the time step in all cases is one femtosecond. Uh, and the ensemble is also NVE. These are periodic systems. 
Okay, so that's our BioXL QMM benchmark suite. So, um, as I said, this is a very concrete sort of example. We're going to discuss you know, some results of some benchmarks that will give you an idea about the usage of computer resources and how they vary depending on these parameters that I've outlined. Now, uh, we've run these benchmarks on a, a, a few different systems. Again, chosen strategically because they represent both the uh, recent past and uh, still current uh, uh, architectures and processors that are available in a lot of places. Um, for example, Cirrus, which is an HPC machine here at APCC in Edinburgh, um, has it consists of 280 compute nodes. Each compute node has two 18-core Intel Xeon Broadwell processors running at 2.1 gigahertz, and each node is 256 gigabytes of RAM, and they're connected through an InfiniBand interconnect. Um, so that's kind of a, you know, I, I don't want to say traditional, but it's kind of like a, a a model of, of, of uh, multi-core Intel processors that have been around has been around in HPC for, for a while now. Then uh, a lot of systems worldwide, including in the EU, are, are starting to appear that include uh, AMD EPIC processors, which have, uh, for example, 64 cores each. So as well as as well as benchmarking our systems on uh, Cirrus, we've also benchmarked on uh, Archer 2, which is the, the national UK supercomputer used for uh, scientific research, um, which is a lot larger, and on which each compute node has two of these AMD Epic Zen 2 ROM processors, each with 64 cores for a total of 128 cores per compute node, running at 2.25 gigahertz. Also 256 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, so that's already one important, interesting piece of information that the amount of memory per core is a lot smaller on that system, which can have implications for how we run our, uh, optimally run our benchmarks. The, the network there is HP, HPE Cray Slingshot, um, which is uh, especially low latency, high bandwidth, interconnect, etc. Now, uh, just a little note about how we have uh, run our benchmarks. What we've essentially done, so these are, these are MD benchmarks using QMM functionality within CP2K. Um, in order to subtract out any initialization cost and to keep things manageable, we have, uh, or as you say, Holly has uh, run lots of lots of runs where we run six MD steps, then we run also one MD step, we subtract the one from six and we get left with five that we average uh, to, to factor out our initialization cost. Uh, that helps not just because of the QM aspects, but also because when we run a CP2K standalone rather than Chromex, which is fine because that's where the performance comes from ultimately, as I've said, there is some, you know, uh, classical parts that that CP2K does that we don't necessarily care about because Chrome X will handle that. And then we also average over multiple runs. You know, we could practice, try to look at any outliers that signify system noise, operating system noise, or network noise. Um, and we've developed also, uh, or Holly's, Holly's developed uh, a script which allows us to uh, analyze the resulting uh, logs, standard format logs produced by CP2K, and to extract not only parallel scaling plots of overall runtime execution time by computing these you know, these averages and uh, the average time per MD step, but also to look to generate. Uh, profiles that that where we can visually see the top however many uh, contributing um, subroutines within CP2K that contribute to the overall runtime the most. Okay, so let's let's dive in to those benchmarks now. So um, we will start with MQAE, and for the MQAE system, MQAE system. Uh, running on the CPU, CPU partition of Sirius that I've just outlined. So what I've shown here is the time per MD step. When I say the time per MD step, it's the wall time. So it's literally the amount of time you need to wait for the program to execute. Um, of course, what many people actually care about is uh, nanoseconds per day when they're actually going to run this as part of an MD simulation. So I've converted this to um, nanoseconds per day, or actually, as it happens, because these are costly calculations, picoseconds per day. And this is on the basis of the assumption that the only thing impacting the runtime um, and the simulation time performance is uh, this computation, which we know is, is uh, uh, true to order, approximate order, to zeroth order, um, as an estimate, as an initial estimate. And um, so we are comparing here so it's all these slides I'm showing, they're showing, and as I said, 
uh, the effect of varying one thing by comparison between two of the benchmarks. So in this case, we're comparing the MQAE with the GGA functional BLIP with the same system with B3LIP. B3 -lip. Now, when we run CP2K, um, as you either already know or will see when you when you start to follow the instructions about to run it, it runs in parallel in two ways with MPI launched according to a number of ranks um, and optionally with OpenMP threading where each MPI rank can have one or more OpenMP threads. Now, uh, in general, it is worth experimenting with this. In general, it can certainly be advantageous to have two, more than one thread. Um, in this case, what I've shown also as a, the most useful thing we thought to summarize uh, the, the, what, the performance characteristics that we've encountered is we've chosen what, what seem like good choices of number of threads per rank. So that also help, hopefully serves as a reference to have some idea of what, what might be good choices. But you always have to try because yourself because it depends on your system and it depends on certain other parameters that we've not even specified here, like cutoffs and all kinds of things. So we see here that um, on Cirrus, we get a performance of, uh, uh, of 17 picoseconds per day for the BLIP case, but and, all, and a little bit less uh, of 13 picoseconds per day for the B3LIP case, which is not too bad. Uh, so we have heart refrog exchange in there, so that, that's giving us something better. And it's not costing us a whole lot more, but it's that's not too bad. On Archer 2, it's kind of similar, but a bit better. I've chosen core counts that are slightly comparable. Uh, of course, each node on Archer has a different number of cores than each node on Cirrus. And since these results, these data points are mostly single node, node increments of one, two, four, eight, etc., they don't exactly coincide. But choosing, comparing two eighty-eight cores on Cirrus with two fifty-six on Archer two gives some some idea that we are roughly in the same ballpark, despite having uh, these two kind of different generation processors, but one Intel, one AMD, um, and one a bit older. Uh, so uh, you know, this. It shows kind of that that often you end up in a, in a similar ballpark with these kind of calculations. Um, the parallel efficiency is something to keep in mind. I've shown it here, calculated. Um, so so when you run in parallel, you have to choose how many cores you want to use, right? So the question is, how efficient is that? Should you use more? And to really determine that, in principle, you should first run on um, the smallest number of cores that you possibly can run on, given your problem. Uh, for example, that you know, if you run on any smaller number of cores, the system might run out of memory, so you have to use more cores. Um, and then compare, see how the execution time changes as um, it decreases as you increase the number of cores that cores that you run on. Um, and essentially, a simple notion is basically if you run on ten times as many cores and it goes ten times as fast as hundred percent parallel efficiency, um, anything less than that is is, is smaller. So. The, the what I've plotted here, what I've shown here, is the parallel efficiency uh, relative to running on a single node. Now that is not to say that you cannot run these benchmarks on on, on less than one full node on any of these systems. For some of them, you can, but um, there's always some ambiguity when you make this decision about what to compare the parallel efficiency to. As I said, it can depend on the parameters. So this was a useful way to get some metric um, for the parallel efficiency at the core count quoted. So at this core counts, it, it looks as if um, you know that performance there, whatever it is, if you're happy to only run at 40% or 50% parallel efficiency, okay, but you're potentially wasting compute budget, so it's potentially not very efficient. So doing this kind of uh, uh, measuring is a useful way to determine whether you're getting bang for your buck, essentially, or a bang for your funder's buck, and whether you're making efficient use of the, of the compute machine. One thing we see often with CP2K is that, as I said, threading can help, general trend that we often see with and we've seen we've seen it with these benchmarks as well is that uh, having more than a single thread can be better especially it seems to push out the performance to be a little bit better at the larger scale sometimes to the detriment of the performance at uh, a single node or whatever the smallest scale is that you're running on so that's something to be aware of um, so uh, yeah, we could go into detail in principle about what, why these, uh, why these don't scale any better. Um, so uh, yeah, we've we've looked in this in detail, but it's 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 perhaps uh, more than than uh, the time that we have here uh, 
mirrors really. So now there's one single change. Next slide, the column on the right has remained the same. So we're still looking at the same P3Lib functional, but on the left, what we've changed is we've increased the QM cell size. So what we've done is we've in increased linearly by a factor uh, two, each linear dimension of the cubic cell, um, leading for an overall eightfold volume increase. And the performance uh, has actually, uh, is just about six times slower on Cirrus than it was for um, the original QM cell size. Um, so you've increased by the volume by factor eight, the performance has gone down by factor uh, five, or sorry, factor six, and Archer 2 is slower by factor five. Why is the difference between two machines? Difficult to say, you'd have to look into, dive into the profiles. It could be that maybe the interfaster, so the faster interconnecting Archer 2 is helping that performance there. So that gives you some sense of how the performance scales with the linear dimension of your QM cell size. It could be cubic, but it looks as if it's doing a little bit, little bit better than, uh, than cub cubically. So let's look at a different system now, uh, a, slight, a system with slightly, slightly more QM atoms and being embedded in a much larger overall system of 668,000 atoms. We're now looking at the GGA, gradient, uh, GGA functional PPE uh, in comparison to its uh, uh, artery fork exchange included equivalent PPE zero. Um, and so there we are again seeing, seeing roughly similar behavior now. Um, it's not necessarily worthwhile comparing well, if you're interested, if you're trying to decide between PPE and BLIP, or trying to decide between PPE zero and B3 LIP, then you couldn't need to com compare those two. Uh, but the interesting point here is, I guess, similarly to the comparisons, comparison between BLIP and B3 LIP, to do the comparison between uh, PPE and PPE zero. So we can see that, yeah, it's costing a bit more. Um, parallel efficiencies is looking a little bit better at the scale that we're looking at. And you get an impression of the, of the uh, the performance uh, in picoseconds per day on both systems. And you can see that trending wise, we really are kind of in the same ballpark on these on these two machines. So then let's look at uh, the CLC system, the ion channel, where we have a case of keeping everything the same apart from the number of QM atoms um, that we designate. Um, oh, actually, and also the also the cell, the QM cell size that, that changes. So there, um, we do actually see, see quite a big difference, as might not be a surprise. Um, so we've got a sort of seven-fold uh, increase on Cirrus uh, in, in the performance going from 253 to, to 19, um, and uh, not as dramatic a change on, the, on, on Archer 2. But the thing to observe here, so there's something going on here, which is, which is instruction, which is useful to know about, which is that when you run CLC two five three, you are actually well. We were on Cir on on, uh, on Archer two and on Cirrus because of the available memory. Uh, you actually have to choose a different parallel scheme parameter for the QMM um, subsystem uh, specification in CP two K. So by default, uh, the parallelization scheme for QMM is is atom based. Um, but that can so that can can require a lot of memory because the the grids that are used to, to do the, the QMM calculations are uh, are replicated. So you make a run out of memory. So then the other option is to use the the grid option for a parallel decomposition scheme, which reduces the memory requirements. But then uh, if you are replicating many atoms, and the performance may suffer. So threading can help. So actually these choices of threading have made a big difference compared to if we had chosen different numbers of threads. So threading here in the case of 253 ameliorates uh, the, 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 the strong effect of that, um, uh, that, of that uh, inefficiency of the, uh, of, the, of the grid scheme. Um, and uh, what's more actually threading allows you to, to reduce uh, the um, to, to make better use of the available memory on the compute node, because if the memory the memory requirements typically uh, for these for the um, well that, okay that's true for 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 hybrid functionals where you specify the the max amount of uh, memory that that it can use to store uh, electron and Bosch integrals, which is not relevant here. But what's funny is that actually underpopulating nodes so that you don't use all the cores. But that what's running there has more memory. Each each core that is running something has more memory available. 
um, means that you can actually uh, run faster. So you might, in some cases, use fewer cores and run faster simply because you then are still able to use the default atom parallel decomposition scheme. Now, the reason why there is this big effect um, uh, is, is, you know, is not something we should go into because that depends on a lot of detail about the profiling. Something that's useful to be aware of when, when you want to run uh, hybrid functional cal calculations, for example, PBE0 or B3lib, is that the mol opt basis set is very costly when combined with hybrid functionals. Now, in CP2K, and generally people say, okay, maybe use HFX basis or EMSL, uh, but these may, may be less bio suitable for biomedical systems, so you should check the liter literature. There is an approach that can help in CP2K to be aware of, which is the auxiliary density matrix method or ADMM. This can help dramatically uh, speed up your hybrid functional calculations with a MOLOPT basis set. For example, with uh, for CLC19 with B3LIP, um, which is not shown in the previous slide, that was B-LIP, uh, using ADMM can accelerate MOLOPT calculations by a uh, you know, factor 15, for example. So it can have a dramatic effect. And if you want to go really beyond Hartree Fock exchange and you think, well, why are we using so few cores? Um, why is it getting badly? I want to run uh, calculations with, with MP2 accuracy. Um, you can do that with CP2K um, or RPA. Uh, you can go really extreme. And that does scale out much better because effectively you're, you're asking CP2K to do much, 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 much more work. So um, the, one of the things you've seen in the profiles is that the, uh, the balance between computation and communication that is required uh, is more favorable, whereas for some of these, um, either uh, systems with fewer QM atoms or systems with not such demanding um, uh, DFT approximations, uh, the amount of communications can, can dominate over the amount of computation that you're actually asking CP2K to do, hence leading to a petering out or diminishing of the scaling efficiency, parallel scaling efficiency. Um, of, of, your, of your simulations. Okay, so you say that's fine with CPUs and, and CP2K runs great on, on, you know, on CPUs over uh, many, many CPU cores on using MPI communication. It's been doing that for years since we heavily optimized. How about GPUs? As I said, many people, the question we get often is how do I run or should I run or can I run CP2K with Chromax on GPUs to do QM calculations because I know my Chromax runs great on GPUs. So to, to check out what the performance was of that, we ran the, these same benchmarks on two different systems, a GPU system on NVIDIA system, uh, the GPU partition of Cirrus, which has four NVIDIA Tesla V100 GPUs per node, and two 20-core Intel Xeon Cascade Lake uh, processors as well per node, which are a bit newer than the 18-core than the Intel Broadwell processors that are on the CPU partition of Cirrus, and has a bit more RAM as well, uh, Per node also connected to InfiniBand. In addition to that, we also looked at, um, uh, we, we were given access to the AMD Accelerator Cloud to see what the performance was like there on a uh, combination of AMD Epic and eight AMD Instinct with my 100 uh, GPUs per node and 512 gigabytes of RAM, which is relevant because, as I said, so these AMD GPUs becoming more and more common, not just in US HPC systems, but also in supercomputers like uh, your HPC's Lumi system, which is up and coming, uh, for which, in fact, the CPTK developers have been, have been or preparing um, as well in collaboration with, um, with the HPE Cray. So um, uh, going through the same uh, benchmarks I went through before, um, what I've done here is, uh, so in principle, you, you should maybe compare what it's like if on the exact same nodes, if you do use the GPUs versus not using the GPUs. However, for practical reasons, it was more efficient to simply use the GPU nodes to run on GPUs and then compare those results as we've done here to the results you've already seen. So at the top, it's always a result you've already seen from the CPU partition, but now comparing it to the GPU partition. Does that make sense? Yes, because, okay, they're somewhat comparable. They're in the same machine, they have the same interconnect. Um, the CPU cores, there are few, slightly fewer of them, and they're also a little bit older um, than the ones in the GPU nodes, but comparable. So what do we get when we use, when we actually tell us, ask CP2K, when we build CP2K to use GPUs in, in all the ways it can, which I'll briefly mention as well? Well, um, you don't get a lot is unfortunately the answer. Um, so you can see that the, the, the performance 
on the CPU nodes is actually somewhat similar to the performance on the GPU nodes. So you're essentially using all four, we're trying to get cell CPK to use all these four uh, GPUs. But for this particular biomolecular benchmark, we can see there's not a massive difference between having those GPUs and not having them. Um, switching to the large QM cell size, we can see that there is a bit more of an advantage here. So we can see that 17 picoseconds per day on the CPU nodes uh, versus 24 picoseconds per day on the GPU nodes. However, um, so uh, yeah, so we we can see actually similar trends in the in the CPD5 system. Yeah, it's slightly better on the GPU nodes, but um, the thing is, if you were so these processors, these CPU cores on the GPU nodes, as I said, they're newer and they're slightly faster and there's slightly more of them. So if you were to not run at all on the GPU, on the GPUs, on the GPU nodes, but just on the CPU cores on, the, on those GPU nodes, it might actually be faster than using the GPUs. Um, we'll get into a moment why, why that is, because we know that CPU2K can perform very well on, on GPUs. It's just a domain of applicability and, and the fit of these biomolecular uh, uh, systems. Finally, for CLC, we kind of see a similar story. It is giving some boost. It is a bit better, um, but but overall, it's not uh, you know an, an over, not seeing you know, a massively overwhelming uh, uh, benefit really. So why is this? It's because actually the typical QM treatments for biomolecular QM simulation, the CP2K, in particular, the number of QM atoms. Um, means that these benchmarks and these simulations do not heavily rely on the parts of CPTK itself or on external libraries that have been heavily optimized to, uh, to op be offloaded to GPU and to do so in a distributed way. So, so CP2K can scale linearly to extremely large system sizes, um, but that is not the, the code path that is being exercised by these biomolecular benchmarks. Um, however, do not despair because, because there is extremely active development ongoing, has been ongoing and continues to be done by the CPU2K developers um, on, uh, not on, on improving the GPU offloading, both on NVIDIA devices and on AMD devices um, uh, within CPU2K itself and also within libraries they, they develop like DBCSR. Um, in particular, the ones to keep an eye out for here are Two electron integrals, which is relevant for uh, which, which, we, which we know are a bottleneck in a lot of the hybrid functional calculations for biomolecular benchmarks, uh, the electron repulsion integrals, which will be just part of the Libint library, as well as some grid operations. Um, and actually, uh, uh, as we started talking to the developers, they, they've started looking at uh, GEEP as well. So we've, we've, we've looked at that a little bit as well. Uh, GEEP, sorry, I should mention is there are the QMMM specific subroutines within the CPU2K that calculate the QM, uh, QMM interactions. So we've only talked about NVIDIA so far. How about AMD GPUs? So CPU2K version 9.1, which was released this January, has experimental HIP offload support via the DBCSR library. However, we know that DBCSR is actually more important for linear scaling um, uh, uh, DFTF calculations rather than uh, what we're exercising with these biomolecular benchmarks. And it can use OpenP multi-threading. Um, there is a HIP backend for the grid operations. Uh, there's an ALPA library, which, which Holly tried, uh, which we don't recommend for production use because it's a lot slower than uh, simply using the CPUs. The Cosma library, which is uh, also used by CP2K, supports uh, HIP, but it's not recommended for production use either for similar reasons. So Holly tried a uh, single node benchmarking of, of one of these systems, uh, the MQAE GGA BLIP. Um, and the performance we get is in a, is kind of similarly uh, uh, um, not necessarily advantageous as the NVIDIA GPUs. So there's eight of these uh, AMD MI hundreds, and there were four of the NVIDIA. No, well, for the four NVIDIA ones, we get 15 seconds per MD step uh, on a single node of series GPU partition. <laughs> With those eight AMD GPUs, we get 11 seconds uh, per MD step. A half node of Archer 2 without any GPUs, but just the AMD Epics is 7.3 seconds per MD step. So it, it just CPU2K just runs really well on CPUs, and you know it's being, but it's being very actively developed uh, for GPUs. Uh, including for for these kind of cases that have not traditionally been been exercised in the code paths and therefore have not received just simply as much development priority. So I think uh, we're getting to the time, so which which is fine. Um, 
I hope this has been useful. We really wanted to give you an, uh, an, an overview in our rough guide, like we said in the abstract for, for the webinar, of uh, the performance of CP2K for kind of biomolecular, typical biomolecular QMM treatments. The benchmark, the benchmark suite is, is on GitHub. Um, there is a best practice guide um, that, we've, that we've put out, uh, which is linked there, which should be useful. You can see on the left-hand side all kind of useful information, and we're expanding that within the, next, within the very near future to include some additional information about not just CP2K standalone, but Chromex together with CP2K. A while ago, already last year, uh, early last year, end of the year before that, we organized best, a workshop on best practices in QM simulation, which really focused on, focused on the software agnostic QM treatment side. And uh, our colleague Dmitry Morozov also gave a webinar earlier on uh, on the interface that he developed. I just wanted to say thanks, uh, of course, to Holly uh, for you know doing loads and loads and loads and loads of work on this, um, and uh, to our colleagues from Bikesa, Emiliano, Mirko, Gerrit, uh, Dmitry, uh, and also to uh, to uh, CP2K developers. Ole Schut has been extremely helpful. And also Thomas Kuna and, and Matthias Krak and other people in Paderborn and elsewhere um, who've been very, very helpful um, in, in talking to us about, about CP2K. So with that, um, I think we can probably... Uh, so thank you questions. very much, Arno. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you. So now we go to the questions. So please go on to type your question in a Q&A section if you forgot up to now or if you will come up a new question. But I will start to read the first one. One, Ike is asking, how did you determine the step size of the simulation? What restrictions on the step size get added in QMMM simulation? Thanks. Well, I have a simple answer, but <laughs> which is basically that these, this is what was used before for, but I don't know if Holly has anything uh, more insightful yeah, so we uh, took the step size from the uh, systems used in the papers that Arno mentioned. Um, so I guess if you're using a, a QMM system, you can expect to maybe have to decrease the step size a bit from using a typical MM si system because you have to resolve the motion of the QM parts as well. Okay, I hope that this it's, answer. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting question actually. The 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 question to what extent the the, the time per MD step. Uh, we thought about this, but yeah, the question to which the time per MD step is dependent on the um, on indeed the, the the time step. So it's not simply that you scale it up and then you you simply use a different time step, but it's only the the you know the the time integration that Gromex does that you have to worry about because or, or worry about. It's more that. Um, so the the wave function, of course, so so CP2K is computing, you know, an approximate wave function for an electronic structure within the QM region. So it's um, and it retains that and tries and then iterates and tries to converge, reconverge via its self consistent self consistent uh, field approximation um, algorithm on the next uh, MD step. And the more distance we think, the more distance, the the more everything has moved, uh, the more everything has Chromex has told everything to move uh, if the time steps are very large the more that the next wave function will be removed from what it's computed in the previous step. So therefore the convergence and the algorithm that CPK does will probably be slower. So there's some, some interlinking there, but I guess you always have to be aware of instability and, and things like, there are lots of things that can go wrong, uh, which I recommend the Q and A between uh, Dimitri and Emiliano and participants of our workshop last year at DPCC on a uh, specifically two day workshop on QMM simulation, uh, Chromex CP2K. Maybe you can add the, the, the link to the chat if you think yeah. it's useful. I can, let us know if this was answering your question. And now we have another question from Khan. Would it be wise to prioritize AVX 512 instruction availability and compatibility in processor chosen for outmost performance gain or do other factors such as CPU count, core count per CPU, or core clock simply contribute more? Well, vectorization is increasingly important in, in modern uh, HPC codes. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that when you compile, I mean, you just pass the flag to tell it, I mean, it matters. I don't know how much it matters, Holly. I don't know if you have any sense of, I don't. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's not something we've looked at. 
I mean, I mean, I, I, I guess you basically, you know, you write, you have some, you have some processors. You better make sure that you do make use of whatever vectorization, vectorization they have, because um, I'm sure at least some CPUs can use it. Okay, now we have a following up question. I mean, not a following up, but another question from Khan. Will CP2K support a more mainstream CUDA capable NVIDIA GCPU like NVIDIA's RTX GPUs? I assume so. I mean, it's just a matter of the precision, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm not, um, yeah, the precision issue. I don't know how, not, maybe CP2K might not be happy with that actually. Um, I think it might might require. I mean, it's, it was like Romax is happy to kind of do mixed and and uh, you know work things out cleverly. I mean, not to see if you guys are clever, but um, I think I, I, I'm I'm not sure to be honest. I think we we've been focusing very much on the on the on the cards that are in these big HPC machines. So I don't think it's even been on our radar as much as small labs because CP2K has traditionally been run you know, at massive scale on these big parallel machines. And so yeah, I don't think there is as much maybe of the kind of you know labs having their own cheap, really cost-effective bang for buck uh, uh, consumer GPUs that they buy because they can get away and get really good performance like they do with Chromax. But but maybe maybe I'm wrong and the CP2K developers, of course, know. Um, And if there are no further questions, I will just want to, to tell you that there will be a next uh, uh, webinar, will be the 7th of June, and it will be about ad hoc. The title has to be right, so keep an eye, so you, can, you, you will know which ad hoc. We think it will go in future ad hoc, so I think we think that it will be on ad hoc 3. And the speaker will be Goa Texera from Giao Texera, from University of Utrecht. And uh, if no other people are, no question are popping up, just check if in the chat there is something in the, in the nobody's right hand. So I, I thank you everybody for the attendance and Arna only for the presentation and for the work. Thank you very much.